Joseph Ho is data visualization, poetry, and wrestling, data scientist. Joseph Ho was born and raised in Singapore. He trained as a neuroscientist in USA and Europe, and currently tracks emergent COVID-19 mutation across the globe. And you still have time to come. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Previously, he developed robust and elegant estimation statistics for data analysis. A tech sorcerer for Sing Po Write Mo, the largest online months-long poetry writing activity in Asia, he archives and visualizes the poetry posted. As a performer, he has been featured in Sing Lit Body Slam, the world's first spoken word pro wrestling show, Spoke and Bird, and the Singapore Writer Festival 2015, 16, and 19. His fictions can be found at the Nature, Futures, and Lab Lit. His poetry is published in different places and various Sing Pro Write Mo anthologies. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Xavier, for that uh, uh, glowing introduction. And thank you to the team uh, here at Imagination for inviting me. Um, let me quickly change the slides. Okay, my clicker works. In fact, the very first thing is to start my talk is I will ask you a question. Okay, the best kind of talks is when I don't start by saying something, but I ask you a question. So if everyone can just take a few minutes to think, what do you think of when you hear the word poetry? What do you think of when you hear the word poetry? And now I'm giving you also permission to open up your mobile devices, or for those of us who are uh, attending this virtually, uh, another browser window. And if you could go to menti.com and enter the code up there, which is 74459832. And um, you should go to a web page where you are able to key in three phrases, three words, which is when you hear the word poetry, when you hear poetry, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Yes, the responses are coming in. I was worried the Wi-Fi wouldn't be working, but that's, that's, that's unfounded. <laughs> wow, coming in fast. Thirty-two, thirty-three. I don't know how many people are coming uh, are here with us today. Uh, we'll we'll give it a you know maybe a couple more seconds. But it's already very interesting what I can see. The word art has not moved from the center of the screen. Interestingly. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, I see, I'm, going to, I'm just going to point out what I find interesting here, which is somewhere in there, there's Poetry Slam. Okay, that's good. This person who put Poetry Slam knows a bit about slam poetry, which I will talk about later. Uh, art, as I said, art has not moved from the center, so a lot of people are just keying in the word art. Um, interestingly, ah, someone said boring, boring poetry analysis. No, no hard feelings, don't worry. Um, yeah, you get uh, names Pablo Neruda, you get Baudelaire, all classic poets, very well known. Now, interestingly, what I see here, what I don't see here in this word cloud is anything to do with community, right? Anything to do with audience, anything to do with, with connection, right? It's all very abstract words, uh, possibly words to do with being alone, introversion and all that, right? Romantic, delicacy, musicality, all abstract stuff. Um, but maybe talks about feelings, but no one really talked about community. So that's interesting to me. We will come back. This is great data. I think I will, we will come back to, to another question later. 
let's just move on. So thank you for your participation. Um, as Xavier mentioned, I am actually a data scientist in the day, so that was very interesting to me to watch a word cloud grow uh, without me having to do anything. Um, but um, let me talk a bit more about myself finally. So I am born and raised in Singapore, uh, but I spent a long period of time away from Singapore. I returned to Singapore in 2015 uh, for postdoctoral work. And um, in 2016, I stumbled onto this Facebook group called Singpo Remo. And it's short for Singapore Poetry Writing Month. Okay, it's a Facebook group. This is actually a live screenshot. Currently at 7,000 members. Um, I joined in 2016, and Singapore Poetry Writing Month is actually modeled on something I think that came about in the US, right? Uh, which was National Poetry Writing Month. Um, but it was actually a group of poets. I uh, don't know if anyone has heard of uh, the poet Joshua Ip. So Joshua Ip and uh, poet Alvin Pang and a few others actually one day decided to uh, set up a group to do National Poetry Writing Month, which is you write one poem a day for 30 days in April. Um, April particularly because it is a reference to a T.S. Eliot line that April is the cruelest month. So 30 days in April. So they set up a Facebook group, meaning for it to be just about five or six of them just doing it privately, but Joshua Ip, the person who set up the group, forgot to make the privacy settings private. So it was actually public. They woke up the next morning. Their little group had ballooned to a couple of hundred people. That was in 2014. By the time I joined in 2016, there was almost 4,000 people. Okay? And this is 2022 20, now. We've been running Singpo Remo on Facebook for eight years, 2014 to 2021. And this year, I'll invite you to join again. Go to facebook.com, groups, Singpo Remo. Anyone can take part. That's the, that's the beauty of it. Anyone can take part. And how does it work? So 30 days, 30 poems. And every day, um, uh, one of the moderators who tends to be a poet or writer in Singapore will drop a prompt, a prompt. So this is an example prompt from 2020, and I will break it down because there's a lot of words on the screen. So firstly, the prompt. There's the main part of the prompt. Here, I, I, from, from, April, from 9th April 2020, it was the theist prompt, which is the preamble. They say science and religion don't mix. But then turning water to wine is chemistry, walking on the sea is physics, and healing the sick is biology. Write a poem about something scientific, but in religious or spiritual terms. So every night, at least at 10 p.m. every night, a prompt will drop, and you have 24 hours at least to respond to it. Although no one is going to kick you out, no one's going to insult you, if you or punish you if you fail the time limit. Okay? So it's very chill. So this is the main prompt, right? Write a poem about something scientific, but in religious or spiritual terms. But I think what makes Singpo Remo so kind of unique to Poetry Writing Month is the presence of what we call the bonuses. Right? So that you can see these various hashtags here. For example, there's a bonus. Rather than just writing some, a poem about something scientific, you can try to do the hashtag atheist bonus. Write about something spiritual instead, but in a scientific way, and so on and so forth. Like I'm going to read the third bonus, home-based learning. This is, of course, uh, right in the middle of uh, uh, Singapore's first lockdown. Religious services are cancelled. Make up your own religious or spiritual language or liturgy in your poem. And uniquely Singapore, I think, um, what a lot of local poets or local participants try to do is they try to satisfy all the bonuses, which can drive you crazy. Singaporeans just like to, you know, uh, answer every exam question correctly. So that's a, so 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 that's the there's a main prompt, right? That's already you know quite challenging and interesting. But if you want to twist things up, there's all these bonuses for every prompt. So this happens every day for 30 days in April. And um, if you don't mind, I will uh, share with you what I did for this prompt. Okay. 
Um, so this is the prompt is to write something scientific in religious terms or religious, something religious in scientific terms. So I wrote this poem called We Are Prone to Metaphor. Solar system as clock, ribonucleic acid as code, to be broken, taken apart, fixed. Protein as machine, prayer as algorithm, God as vending machine. Collapse star as shapeless and colorless as we are prone to dogma. Light as beach ball or cold surf. Map as accurate as mental picture. Apple as origin myth for the shape of our throat and as origin for moon's dance with earth. Waltz as astrophysics, cha-cha as Brownian motion, twerk as butterfly flapping so as to change its own story. One of us never gets the cure because each experiment must have a control. The cell is a city with a nucleus and garbage disposal and powerhouses and a wall to keep the alien out. So I, I don't know how I managed that in 24 hours, but I did. But that's the fun part. You just dive in. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, but for me, one of the most um, remarkable, notable things about Singapore Remo is the community that builds around this Facebook group. So as you can see here in this screenshot, so I, you, know, you write a poem and you post it to this Facebook group. Okay? And Facebook being Facebook, there's multiple things going on. There's the reaction, so you can see uh, reactions, people can thumbs up, people can like it, people can ha, ha all the Facebook reactions are there, number one. But you've also got the comments below. Okay? And the comments, I think part of, part of uh, and this has taken uh, literally years to build up, which is the people behind Singpo Remo um, encourage the participants to critique the poem. Not just, not just you know, give, give each other a pat on the back, but say, okay, what worked for me, but also what didn't work for me. Right? So helping pe giving people constructive feedback to help people better their poetic craft. And you can see here, I think, um, uh, Ali Chua, uh, she commented, okay, you know, what was good, but also some minor suggestions, right? She was saying some lines can be cut. What she liked, what she doesn't like. So it's not just, uh, you know, uh, a nice, you know, fuzzy, oh, we're all writing poetry, but it's like, hey, let's, let's do this properly. Let's, let's get better at what we are, you know, what we want to, you know, at our, at our po poetic craft, okay? But also, you can see below, and right at the bottom, this, uh, you know, so both Ali, Chua, and Min Lim, I actually, I, I'm one of the many people I met on this Facebook group, and now I call them my friends. And you can see, it's not just critique, but it's people just enjoying each other's company as far as you can on a Facebook group, right? So that's, that's special for me, and I encourage you, uh, you know, this month in April to go and check it out. Um, but again, I've been saying, you know, this is all so far, you know, I've only shown you screenshots, right? Uh, one of the hallmarks is there's always an opening party. So on the 31st of March, people gather uh, uh, and have a reading party. And, then at, and there's also a closing party at the end, at the end of April. So, so on, the, on the right is me and the, you know, my first closing party, reading one of the poems I, wrote, I, I, I actually composed for Singapore Remo. And uh, on, the, sorry, on the left, that's me. On the right uh, is, I think, the closing party from either 2017 or 2018. So it's, it's community, right? You do something together with people on a Facebook group, but then you meet up in real life, you forge real, forge real uh, um, uh, relationships, okay? And not only that, ever since, I think from 2014 all the way to 2018, in fact, a group of the, the some of the poets who, who provided the prompts, they will actually sift through the poems that are posted on Singapore Remo, and every month, Every month, there's anywhere between 3,000 to 4,000 poems posted every month. And the editors diligently go through as many of them and compile it into an anthology that you can you know, go to a bookstore and buy. Okay? And uh, in recent years, uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons, it's actually moved online. There's a magazine, singporemo.com. That is still curated. Uh, all the poems curated from uh, every month's uh, Singapore Remo. So plenty of content there for you to explore. I hope you guys check it out, singporemo.com. Um, now, so I, I took part in this first, first in 2016. 
um, and I'm still a part of it. Um, but I think in 2017, I started asking myself, okay, as I said, there's three to 5,000 poems posted every month in Singapore Remo. In the past seven years, almost 22,000, more than 22,000 poems. So I asked myself, what if I downloaded every single poem and kind of analyzed it? What will we see? Okay. And um, it was a fun project. This was actually from, you know, I analyzed uh, four months worth of Singapore Remo from 2014 to 2018. And uh, maybe the lighting is not that great, but this is the, 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 the top words used in poems. So the top five words are time, day, love, poem, and life. Right? So, okay, that's interesting. And uh, I also was able to do what I call a word wall. It's not quite a word map or word cloud, but a word wall. Sorry, that's later. I'll talk about a word wall later. So besides, now, as we all know with Facebook posts, you can just, you don't have to upload text. You can upload images, right? You can upload a, a, a video also. So what you can do is also pull out how many posts have pictures attached to them. Because sometimes some of the one or two prompts, in fact, you can see it here. One prompt in 2016 and one prompt in 2017 that lights up bright yellow. Participants were supposed to post a picture alongside their poem. And you can see that light up here, right? So that's cool. And then not only that, what we saw very clearly is generally from 2014 moving to 2018, right? Uh, it's getting brighter. So more people are actually posting pictures alongside their poems, or some of you might be familiar with Instagram poetry, simply po you know, getting a, you know, writing the poem, maybe formatting it nicely in Word or whatever, taking a screenshot of that and uploading it. You can see that, I think, the trend there as well. So that's interesting. And as, uh, this is just a cool thing that I, I thought was just interesting to look at, which is if you upload an image, the, you know, Facebook also provides you with the dimensions of the image. So just plotting the outline of every image, just a nice picture, okay, very interesting. You know, just to show, okay, I was just trying to like, okay, this is my hobby, and what I do for my day job is data visualization. You know, what, 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 what can we see? So this is the word wall that I mentioned earlier, right? So previously, you know, I was showing the top 10 words used in the poems. Here is words that I used a hundred to a thousand times. So this is where, you know, I don't normally do this for my day job, but I know I can do it, you know, uh, which is, you know, you pull out words used a hundred to a thousand times, but then kind of superimpose this kind of like coloring onto it so that it, 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 it both provides an image and information, right? Data visualization. And just to give you a zoomed in picture, right? These are just some of the words used, you know, hundred to a thousand times in the poetries. Uh, and, you know, just coloring some of the letters based on, you know, what I want to color it. So that's, that was fun to do. Now, what was also interesting is I uploaded all of this, you know, shared it with the participants of Singapore Remo. Say, hey, check this out. This is what I did, right? And the, part and, you know, and the group members found it really interesting. In fact, one of the poets, Rodrigo, who was doing a, who was preparing prompts for that year, you know, he said, okay, look, Joseph did this. Now, take, you know, five words from the list of words appearing 11 or 20 times and use it in a poem. So there's this, you know, coming back to community, but also from the artistic perspective or the creative perspective, this, this synergy, this back and forth, like someone throws out an idea, someone runs with it. So that's always fun to do. That's always, that's always cool. <clears throat> now, another part, another, another interesting thing, another idea that, you know, silly me, you know, because I guess I'm bored, said, okay, I've downloaded 22,000 poems from a Facebook group. What if I use these 22,000 poems and ask the computer to learn from these poems so that it can write its own poetry, computational poetry, right? And very quickly, some of you might be familiar with this, Markov chains, which is, you know, um, this, look at this graph. Okay, so the word I can be followed with I am or I like, right? And um, computers can analyze, you know, uh, massive databases of natural language, right? Our text messages, our web, web posts, news articles, and say, okay, I am 
is more likely to occur than I like. So all probabilities, right? And you can just, you know, roll the dice as it were, say, okay, I am, I am Sam, or I am an engineer. There's those forking paths in the graph here. And that's basically how your predictive keyboards work on your phones, right? Markov chains. And Markov chains are really cool because you can use them not just to help you type out your text message, but also to compose poetry if you train it on the right database of text, which here, in my case, is Singapore Remo. So, going full circle. So this was a prompt from 2019 from the poet Natalie Wang, um, which is about, just to zoom in a bit, sorry, just to zoom in, it's a ritual creepy pasta prompt. So let me read it out for you. You hear about a ritual that will give you your heart's desire. Write about the ritual and what it will give you. Wealth, the ability to mind read, the answer to life, universe, and everything? The recipe for the best fried chicken? Think about how you came to hear about it, what the ri ritual requires you to sacrifice, whether you choose to perform it, what happens when it goes wrong. So you bring us to write a ritual, write a poem about a ritual or something about a ritual. Right? All that preamble is meant to give you a lot of ideas. But to me, I read it, I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to write about a recipe or a ritual. So I decided, having downloaded 22,000 poems, okay, I'm going to train a Markov model, okay, and write a poem about it, right? So what I did, I downloaded here, it was slightly less, 16,000 poems. I generate a Markov model. And for Markov models, you need to give it a starting phrase. Because in my mind, I thought, okay, because I'm supposed to write about a ritual, let's say I give it verbs, which is like, go to, take from. So I was just using these short phrases to generate as many lines as I could. Okay, and this is, I, I, so I generated, so this poem here that I posted is fully computer generated. I didn't edit it except for, I think, only two or three places for grammar. I did not, so I did not edit it at all. So let me read it to you. How to write your computer a poem. Give it a self-portrait Stir in the space around you, myriads upon myriads of questions and answers. Watch the goddess in the machinery of night. We haven't done this before. Play the hand and mud caresses clogged throats. Leave out the death penalty, our Disneyland has lost its grip. Cut off one character. Kiss the heart of stone. The rhythmic gallop of a loved one died. Chop up those poor aquatic creatures floundering in an imagined salvation. Write down his pockets. Sing to the queen bed just enough for you. Remember how it is not big enough to be reached during low tide. I would not normally write poetry like that. This is super, I think it's kind of weird. But it's trained on, you know, all the participants' kind of collective input, right, as it were, right? So that's interesting. That's, that, that, that was fun. That was fun. I find it fun. I find it cool. So there's this whole thing about, you know, as I said, coming full circle or Within this Facebook group, at least, someone throws an idea out, another person runs with it. That's, that's, that's what I found, you know, that's what keeps me coming back year after year, since 2016, okay? Now, so yeah, just to plug it, feel free, uh, if you're interested, check out the poetry there. Uh, generally, uh, outside of April, it's kind of low volume when April comes, which is, you know, in three months' time, when April comes, it's, it will take over your Facebook feed. And that's good fun. <laughs> okay. Now, um, you guys have been listening to me. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. What do you think of when you think of pro wrestling or when you hear the words pro wrestling? So I'm going to go back. And now, if you can go back to your menti.com, same code, right? When you hear the words pro wrestling or when someone tells you pro wrestling, what comes to your mind? So feel free to get, you know, three, three, three words, three phrases. <clears throat> Money, I like that, yeah. Oh, violence is not moving away from the center of the screen. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> I 
Did someone put Neymar? Okay. I, like, I, 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 think, I, I think I know that reference, but... <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, sumo wrestling. I see sumo wrestling in there. Of course, WWE has to be on there. <clears throat> and I see a bunch of wrestlers' names as well. Brett the Hitman Hart is one of my favorite wrestlers, so we'll put that up there. That's great. Awesome. Yeah, fake is fake and fight. Fake is up there. Uh, no comments. <laughs> Kung Fu Panda, okay, that's, 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 uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, reference. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> so why do I bring up pro wrestling? Why do I suddenly, you know, change gears and ask you to think about pro wrestling? <clears throat> so the reason is because <clears throat> uh, in 2017, um, I was part of the team that put up the world's first, I think it's the world's first um, <clears throat> poetry and pro wrestling live show. Um, yeah, so those are two, I think I have two screenshots of, I think, uh, media coverage from uh, the new paper and today. And don't worry, I'll, I'll show you more pictures of <clears throat> people suspended in mid-air about to, about to land on their faces. So, let me... Um, there's a lot. I'm, I'm, let, me, let me talk to you through this slide first. So on the left, on the left, um, there's a Chinese man who's not wearing shades, right? The Chinese man <clears throat> who's wearing black, black, black frames. That man is Joshua Ip. Okay, that man is Joshua Ip. Uh, on the right, on the right, you can see a man and a woman. Um, the man in red, right, in the foreground, that, that man is Greg Ho. <clears throat> now, why do I point these two people out? So Joshua Ip, he's the founder, he's the one who started Sing Po Remo. So he's a poet. Greg Ho is the founder, is a co-founder of Grapple Max, which is one of, I think there's only two, one of two pro wrestling promotions here in Singapore. So that's Greg Ho and Joshua Ip. Now, both of them went to the same school together when they were teenagers. And um, legend has it, actually it's not legend, it's true. Uh, there was a New Year's Eve party where they had a kind of school reunion. And Greg asked Josh, hey, what are you doing? And then Josh like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a poet right now. And then Josh asks Greg, what are you doing? Oh, I just set up a pro wrestling school. And probably fueled by alcohol or whatnot. <laughs> Both of them said, we have to collaborate. Okay? And this is the Franken baby that emerged. So, what are you looking at here? I said Singlet Body Slam. Singlet stands for Singapore Literature, short for Singlet Body Slam. So on the left again, actually, is Joshua and his wrestler, shall we say, who is Raffles. So in the left corner is Raffles, and on the right corner is William Farquhar. So for those of us who are a bit more familiar with Singapore history, I think we all know the name Raffles, right? His name is plastered all over buildings and roads and houses here. Raffles, Sir Stanford Raffles. However, and this is part of the history that Singaporean kids have to learn, is Raffles and Farquhar wrestle each other. Okay? So there's Raffles and Farquhar wrestling. And it's almost like the poets are also trading, the poets are also trading verses. So they're trading, like slam poetry, some of you might be familiar with slam poetry or rap battles, where poets or rappers are trading verses. So that's happening while the pro wrestlers are going at it. Okay? So kind of like, kind of like that, right? Uh, that's Raffles giving Fakwa a scoop slam. And that's, that's uh, Raffles getting, sorry, that's Fakwa getting, getting back, his back broken. So while this is happening on stage again, the poets are in, the, are in two corners of the ring, just shouting at each other. It's bonkers. I don't know how it works, but it's a lot of fun. Trust me. And why I, I, I actually, 
there are, the, the only videos I could find were actually shaky handheld audience videos, and I don't want to ruin that for you. So I have very good high-res pictures for you. I share that with you now. So that was Singlet Body Slam. We were able to do crazy things like Raffles versus Farqua, right, for a match that ended, you know, to end all kind of colonial histories. We also had one where it was a tag match of Singlish versus proper English or Queen's English. Um, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun writing it and also learning, you know, uh, how to stage it. So this was my first, you know, I was actually the, one of the poets uh, performing in 20, 2017, Singlet Body Slam. And I, that was where I met, you know, the wrestlers from uh, Grapple Max. And so that's cool, I, you know, I, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, networking, as you say. So I, I got to know them there. Now, that was 2017. In 2019, I think the audience um, reaction was so good from 2017 that we decided to say, okay, let's do this again. So we did Singlet Body Slam too much too soon, okay? Um, and you can see, again, that's actually Farqua giving Raffles, uh, gonna break his ankle there. And yeah, I was, the, I was both the mic man and I think one of the performers there, one of the poets there, and you can see that's a huge, both wrestlers and performers ready to go at it. And one of the cooler matches from, I think, Singlet Body Slam 2 is a hawker versus a hawkerpreneur. So, towards the, in the foreground, you can see actually that's Smart Dave, one of the wrestlers from uh, Grapple Max, Smart Dave. And uh, he's, he's poet, he's paired with Steph Dogfoot, who's on the right, okay? So Steph Dogfoot and Smart Dave are the hawkerpreneurs. Maybe someone here <laughs> in this room might be a hawkerpreneur, right? Smart vending machines, right? The next grab delivery food app. Versus, and you can see in the background, is... Uh, the wrestler, Big D, who's holding, you know, about to whack. He's about to whack Smart Dave, Big D. And Melissa Rani Selva, who's actually a spoken word poet. They are the old school hawkers. So this was a match to say, hawkers fighting against, you know, the, the startup, startup hawkerpreneurs. Um, but it looks like Smart Dave, the hawkerpreneurs are going to get whacked there. <laughs> oh, another match we did in Singlet Body Slam 2 was Yi Shun is fighting for their independence from Singapore, right? And um, here, in fact, here, Singapore is in the back, as you can see, uh, that's uh, Val, one of the champions from uh, Grapple Max. He's representing Singapore. Somehow, he manages to call Raffles from the sidelines to help him, right? Way back from, you know, Raffles, we thought we got rid of him in 2017, but he shows up again. So that was really cool to tell, you know, we have a longer story arc and have fun with historical characters and, you know, and all that. So yeah, Singlet Body Slam. Now, this was 2019. You know, I had another, you know, crazy fun time working on it. And I said, I said to myself, in fact, and, and, and this was also around the time, you know, I, I said to myself, I, I told my wife, what's stopping me from joining Grapple Max, right? Because... Grapple Max is actually a wrestling school. So, 2019, I start training with them. Um, because I said, okay, you know, I like being in the ring, even though here, I, I, you know, I was the mic man. Uh, I enjoyed being in the ring on the mic. But what would it be like to be in the ring fighting? So, 2019, I started training with Grapple Max. And that's me as a trainee, very early trainee, um, doing a takedown. And wrestling, I can tell you wrestling, pro wrestling is one of the hardest things uh, I've ever done. Um, let me show you a very short clip. This was actually, I think this was taken, you know, a week ago. So, you know, Gravel Max is a pro wrestling school. We have a nice ring, as you can see. Um, and during class, we have to practice drills. We do a spot, right? Over and over until we can, you know, presumably take down our opponent. So this is a spot where I think I dominate, I hope. So he kicked out. That's what it is. 
Yeah, so that's what you get to do if you, you know, <laughs> decide to step in the ring. But yeah, so it's really interesting that, you know, um, starting from poetry, I ended up joining Grapple Max Pro Wrestling, and this was my debut, uh, sadly in the middle of COVID, last, uh, last year, April. Um, but yeah, we did an Insta, Insta live stream, uh, tag match, so... Uh, I am a pro wrestler because of poetry. It's weird to say that line, but that's true. And um, this is a shot. This is a shot from the match. Um, trying to break this guy's ankle. Um, you can watch it online to find out what happened. Yeah. So uh, check out Grapple Max. This is their Instagram page, Grapple Max. Um, let me know if you guys. Just let me know if you guys, any one of you decides to check us out. Um, be super cool. Um, and yeah, um, you know, uh, it was a long time, you know, both, I think um, here is where it gets a bit personal for me because, you know, it's all about community. You know, both poetry and pro wrestling is where I've met a lot of friends, a lot of people who I call friends now. And unfortunately, because of the situation we're in, I think as we're all aware, poetry uh, slams uh, can't really happen. They're difficult to put on. And pro wrestling, we, we, we are going to put on a live show very soon, but we haven't been able to put on live shows for close to two years. So, um, but, you know, we still can train, so I, I, I'm thankful for that. And I guess that's, this is where I, I, I think I, I'll wrap up to say, you know, I've talked about, you know, <laughs> can't believe I talked about data visualization, poetry, and pro wrestling in the same slide deck. Uh, and, um, but for me, it's really when I think about these two words, very abstract words, right? Poetry, you know, because all, all of you put very abstract words. Pro wrestling, you put some, you know, uh, uh, wrestling stars. But when I hear these two words for me, what comes to mind are the friends I've made through these activities. The friends I've made and... Um, the things I've learned about myself. Uh, through Simpo Remo, I learned actually writing a poem a day isn't that hard, right? It's doable. And pro wrestling, I've learned your body can do a lot more than you think it can do. It might be difficult, but you know, I'm, I'm actually 30, 38 this year, and I started wrestling what, when I was 36. Most of the guys in Grapple Max are 10 years younger than me, so I don't know how I keep up, but yeah. But your body can do things that, you know, you thought you, you can never do. So that's, that's what I want to leave you with. Um, poetry and pro wrestling is all about community. And um, I'm happy to have any, uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Josef, for the, for the talk. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions. We have also some questions in the... In the, in the class, in this, in this one. Um, the first thing that I, I want to share with you is, is thank you because it's a demonstration of one of the value of Imagination Week, which is transdisciplinary, mm. and how actually you are able to mix different disciplines. Uh, to what extent, uh, actually, the, the passion that you have for poem makes sense with your scientist activity, your daily life? Is it poem for you like a patient? Or is it something that you can, it can nourish each other? It can nourish the poem, as we can see, for instance, with the data visualization, it's quite clear. On the opposite side, to what extent poem or your passion for poem, for instance, can lead you or can drive you or can inspire you for your scientist daily life? Right. Um, okay. No, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think... I think at least anyone who calls themselves a scientist or even data scientist, I think it's always driven by, you know, what we, what we put, you know, I'm going to, what we put in these, you know, here, right? We're always, we're driven by those same things. I think scientists are actually driven by these things, beauty and art, because we think that the world has rules and those rules are beautiful, you know. That's not a very scientific thing to say, but I think a lot of scientists are driven by that, right? Um, now, what I also notice here is when you, know, when you hear poetry, not a lot of people actually put precision. And 
it might not look at it, not, might not look like it, but there's, I, think, I think poets are precise because they want to be able to say something precisely. And that's why sometimes they use a different form. They use rhymes, for example, to do that. So I think, yeah, poets are precise. Scientists look for beauty, whereas normally what you would think scientists want to be precise, poets look for beauty. So that's, 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 that's where, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Question from the class. Uh, I don't, um, I don't have the name. Yes, over there. Could you just press the button in the front of you? Is it good? Yep. Uh, thank you very much for your words and your your time. Actually, I was uh, really excited to attend to your lecture, um, as uh, I think that art is, um, is a major component of uh, our lives. It personally drives me uh, in my uh, daily life, in my personal life, uh, academic life, and even in my professional life. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to know that uh, it's a bit like the question of Professor Xavier Pavi. Um, what influences you the most um, in your life? The codes of uh, poetry or the, the values of pro wrestling? I mean, if you had to choose, which has the, wow. the biggest influence? Thank you. Okay, what makes I think I think <laughs> I think. Um, I like the, I like, okay, where, I'm going to say it's the, what influences me the most, I would say, all three of them, whether it's my code, when I do, you know, data analysis, data, my code, poetry, or pro wrestling, for me, it's, 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 it's that, it's that, um, opportunity, that sheer opportunity to create something from your mind. To be able to say, I see something in my mind and then I make it happen on the screen as a data visualization, on the page as a poem, or for pro wrestling is, I want to be able to do this to my opponent. Let me learn that. Let me, let me train my body to do that. So it's, it's, I think it's that idea of, I can literally do anything that I can imagine. Right, and I see that I think across all three disciplines that I that I, that I take part in. Um, there is another point. Uh, it's possible to go back to the slide. Um, how how write your computer a poem? Right. Okay. Um, and yes. Right. This one. Uh, yeah. With, with yes. The, yes. This one. Yeah. Um, we were wondering, actually, to what extent the content comes from yourself, comes from the words that you put in, and to what extent there is a link between what the computer is doing as well as the environment. Let me be very transparent and honest with you, and I don't want to be too provocative, but it's because I was really surprised when I look at it. It is mentioned, the number th five, I guess, Leave out the death penalty. Our descendant has lost its grip. Of course, you, as a Singaporean, you know what's happened with this sentence. Everybody knows that. So I was really surprised that a computer can create just a phrase with both three words, but based on a Singaporean um, coder or how do you call it. How could you explain that? Yeah, no, that's, wow. How much time do we have? <laughs> No, I think, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I have another talk with, that I gave, I think, at, um, uh, at, the, at the art museum, where someone invited me to talk about art and AI. Okay, so let me try and answer this very simply. So, you are right, I think, as I said, this was derived from a bunch of Singaporean-based or Singapore poets writing poetry. So, so in some sense, you would, you know, that kind of, those kind of, the, the way they use language would be in that model, number one, right? Because that's, that's what it's trained on. Um, number two, I think the main point, which is, which is, I think, which is what my, I think a lot of computational poetry is like reading a horoscope. What do I mean by that? Now, because not, a, you know, no one decided to, you know, no one sat down and said, I want to say A, or I want to tell my spouse how much I love them. So I write. That didn't happen here, right? A computer just based on math, based on some probabilities. 
So what we get as humans reading that is kind of free association. We bring along. So it's not just, so I said point one, it's the Singapore poets, because it's trained in how they use language, that seeps in. But also, you, as someone who has lived in Singapore, you know, say we're using in Singapore for a long time, your knowledge also seeps in as a reader. Right? So those associations are also coming in. The third one about where I came in, yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just pushing a button on the computer, right? But even though I think the first two or three words of each line are supplied by me, that's it. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, beyond making poem with the machine for fun, do you think poems made by algorithms express anything? Do they make you feel something? Right, wow. I think, I think um, that's a great question. I think similar to what I just said you know, to, in response to Xavier's question, which is, yeah, I think they make you feel something, but it's, you know, something, okay, when you read a kind of a poem written by a human, it tells you more about the poet. When you read a poem that was generated by a computer, all you're doing is just looking at yourself, honestly. That's the way I say it, right? Like, it's, it's exactly like when you read a horoscope, it's free association. You're bringing your own biases, you know, where you are at that moment as you interpret that, those words, as you interpret the text. And so the fact that you feel something, I think it's almost, I don't want to invoke Descartes, but it's almost that, right? Like the fact that you feel something means it reveals not just about you, but also reveals something about how we use language. And for me, that's also another, ah, that's another point. I think for me, what's fascinating about computational poetry, it reveals the, the, almost the rules of language that we take for granted. How come when you say something in one way, it sounds like your boss is telling you off? But if you write it in a different way, it sounds so different. So those unspoken rules of language that we use every day, computational poetry almost brings it to the front because no, a human didn't write that, but it's based on how we all use language together. We have another question. Uh, one of the challenges um, with the sheer level of data that exists today is as much what not to use as what to use and what to use. How do you consider the credibility of data or balance the insights you take from database on its apple-shaped origins? Wow. No, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that person obviously is a bit more, uh, I think, data science-y. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think... Um, I think, I think, you know, maybe to draw, draw a link to what I've just talked about, I think that comes with practice. I think, number one, yes, there's so much data. Uh, anyone who's, you know, done a bit, any, any kind of course in data visualization or data analytics knows that, that data cleaning is the worst part and the main part of the job. And to be able to do that well, that comes with practice. And it goes back to, you know, why write a poem uh, one, wh why write one poem a day for 30 days? Just to practice. It's just getting the muscles up, you know, learning yourself. Why do I go to training for pro wrestling every week, even though my back tells me I shouldn't? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just training, you know, such that it's, it's, it's learning something in, such that it becomes mu muscle memory, right? So about the data, you know, about coming, and I'm now coming back full circle to, okay, you know, how do I know what data include or not? It comes with practice. I think it comes with practice. <laughs> yeah. All right. And just to continue actually on the topic, Axel asks you, how would you apply data science algorithms to your new patients pro wrestling? Oh, data science algorithm. I mean, I've actually thought about this for, you know, on and off, which is if, if somebody has a database of, you know, uh, kind of like what you see maybe in baseball, right? Like analytics, right? Like, or even soccer, right? football, which is, you know, the number of passes, average number of passes, you know, number of corners, and that kind of thing. Uh, if, there's a, if, if someone can pay somebody or train a machine, train a computer to, like, watch hundreds and thousands of wrestling videos and kind of codify that, like, like what, 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 what pro wrestling moves seem to be the most effective, all that stuff, that would be interesting. But I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think all that data has been, all that information has been kind of digitized yet. <laughs> 
Thank you. Antoine asked the question, uh, following questions. One could consider that poetry is first and foremost about reading, and that the most important is what the reader makes out of the poem. But from your experience, is it really the same thing to read a poem that you know was written by a human or an, and by a machine? How was your poem received compared to other poems written by human? Oh, um, okay. How was it? Okay, the first question there is, you're right, I would agree, yeah, I think a po you know, reading a poem does reveal you know, who the poet is, but also who you are, I think, because why are you responding to certain lines a certain way? I think it goes back to you know, when, I, when I mentioned about you know, the, um, the ability to, uh, you know, to comment, inside, comment on people's poems, what worked for you, what didn't. And sometimes it's just, yeah, it's just who you are as a reader. You bring in your own you know, biases and whatnot, All right? Um, and yeah, it goes back to the same thing, like reading a, comp a computer-generated poem. I think the, the response, response is interesting. I think Singapore Remo is very interested in, at least in the recent years, very interested in more kind of like randomized forms of poetry. So some people have even um, experimented with, okay, you know, you, you, you know you, Excel spreadsheet, you've got an Excel spreadsheet. And what they do is one line is it's, its own self-contained line. And then they ask people to just click the randomize function, and then it shuffles the lines up, right? So, so then, then you're questioning, okay, does the order make me feel different, right? So I think, I think, yeah, bottom line is computational poetry or poetry that is generated by a computer should make us question, okay, how much do we, maybe language we think is complicated is not that complicated because a computer can actually get quite far, number one. And number two is, is, you know, with all these assumptions about language. So it, it, for me, it, it, does, it, it does the same thing as a poem written by a poem, poet, a human poet does, which is also to make you aware that language is both very limited, but you can also do so much with it. Yeah. Last question. Um, you spend your day, as you mentioned to me, with the COVID-19. That's basically your, your daily life. Yes. Uh, to what extent you can have, do you want to do, or maybe you try to fight in order to not do that, but to get some inspiration for poem? Wow, collective consciousness. Of course, stuff like lockdown, and you know, that, that seeps into people's poetry. Talking about lockdown, talking about you know, not seeing your loved ones, all that, all that, all that baggage is in there, number one. For me, I think... I think, if anything, uh, both my day job uh, just makes me want to say, okay, how far can I push the computational poetry? But COVID-19 specifically, I don't know. I just, I, I find it a bit too depressing to use it artistically, but that's just me because I think a lot of people, I think um, definitely a lot of people have made, you know, plays and art from the situation we're currently in. But for me, I'm just like, I don't want to think about it <laughs> outside of my day job. <laughs> So that's why I go to pro wrestling. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. being with us today. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Um, we have one question here. Yeah, I'm please. Sorry, I just had a question. Oh, please, please, to... please, please, uh, please, please. Uh, just if someone creates an algorithm that writes a poem, uh, is there any artist in this situation? Who does this poem belong to? And uh, yeah, who uh, has the right to use and to exploit this poem? Right. No, that's a great question. So if a computer, I would say there's at least two people or two at least persons, group of people that you can say wrote it. So the first one is the person who wrote the code, I think. Um, yeah, the person who wrote the code. The person who actually wrote the code to allow a computer to create poems. But the second, which is I think what I've been alluding to, it's what was the computer trained on, right? So you, I think some of you have seen online, oh, you can write not just poems, or you can write a story in the style of a certain author. You can write a romance novel, right? Because those computer, those algorithms are trained on a specific corpus, a specific body of text. So then, are the people or the persons who wrote that body of text 
are they also to be credited? I think that's another question. I would say to some extent, yeah. I think some of you, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't talk about this in the talk. I think definitely some of you here are aware of GPT-2 and GPT-3, right? These massive models that I think it's the OpenAI that is funded by Elon Musk. OpenAI, they've developed these massive text models, GPT-2 and GPT-3, that you say, hey, write me a science fiction uh, story with, with Gandalf, and then it will write something along with a bit of Lord of the Rings inside, right? And the reason why you can do that is because they went into Reddit, took every link that had been upvoted, I think more than three times, so that means a proper link. See? So they went to Reddit, took all the links, downloaded the text from those links, and then trained their model on this massive chunk of internet text. So in some way, I would like to think, all of us contributed to that. Right? If you publish any blog post or whatever, I would like to think it's, it's been vacuumed into the model. So are, are, we, are we, you know, so I think to some extent, yeah, we are responsible for that. Like we are, you know, credit, because how else does a machine learn language? For those of us who have kids or nephews or nieces, all they need to learn language is to either watch a YouTube video or hear us talk. A computer, however, just needs to eat up the whole of the internet, which is what we all contributed to. Right? So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.